I'm a philosopher. And for the last five years or so, I've been trying to answer a question. And it's a question that I found very difficult to answer, which is why I thought it'd be awesome to share it with all of you. So the question is this. Suppose that there were a pill that you could take, a pill which would make you more intelligent, smarter. It would help you to focus. It would help you to stay awake. It would help you to learn. Would you take it? Yes. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so I first encountered the topic of cognitive enhancement while reading a story in a newspaper. It talked about students in America popping drugs, popping pills called Ritalin, Adderall, Modafinil, in order to get better grades at college. And the more I read, the more I realized that this wasn't just an American phenomenon, right? It happens to be a worldwide phenomenon. In fact, just last year, Dr. Jason Mazinov's research from the University of New South Wales was reported on, and according to Dr. Jason Mazinov, apparently Australian students are popping these pills faster at a greater rate than students even in America. So, naturally, I thought, right, smart drugs, this is the sort of thing that a philosopher should be interested in, that an academic should be interested in, perhaps. Maybe I can get more work done. <laughs> so, <laughs> I did a bit more research, and here's what I found. So, each of these drugs is, they're all prescription drugs. They're prescribed for conditions like attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder, and for narcolepsy, and a few other conditions. However, when they are taken by healthy individuals, what happens is that they wake you up. And the reason why they do this is because in different ways, they're all central nervous system stimulants. So they wake you up, they help you to focus. They help you to focus on you know, mundane tasks, like reading through those papers that your professor set for you. Um, sitting up at night, studying before, before an exam. And that's kind of exciting, but my excitement was really dampened when I heard about some of the side effects, when I read more papers. So the side effects include elevated blood pressure. Um, there's the risk of addiction and dependence, because of course these are central nervous system stimulants. Um, and of course, there's also the risk of not being able to fall back asleep at night, right? because you're being kept awake. In addition to the various side effects, there are also a bunch of other problems to do with the law. So if I wanted to get one of these drugs, how exactly would I get them? I don't have any of these conditions, so I would have to lie to my doctor to pretend that I've got the symptoms, but I wouldn't do that. Alternatively, perhaps I could, well, approach somebody who's already got them, who has had a prescription written for them for their condition and say, hey, I'll pay you some money for that. Except that's also illegal because the government subsidizes these medications. Now, the other thing I could do is I could perhaps go online and try and hand over my credit card to an online pharmacy. And of course, who knows what will happen with my credit card details, right? Um, and then, will I even get the thing that I wanted to get? Maybe I'll get some sort of a toxin. Instead of enhancing my brain, it'll kind of kill it. But even if I do get the stuff that I wanted, I might then be up on criminal charges for importing a controlled substance. So for all of these reasons, I thought, look, what an amazing set of substances, cognitive enhancement, and how fantastic to be able to enhance your ability to learn. But my enthusiasm was dampened. And at first I thought, wow, what a pity. But the more I've reflected upon this, the more I've thought, actually, Maybe it's not a pity, maybe it's a good thing. Because if not for these problems, then cognitive enhancement would be poised to become the new normal. Here's what I mean by this. Back about 15 years ago, we had the public liability and insurance crisis in Australia. So HIH went under, and professionals were being sued left, right, and center. For instance, surgeons were being sued for negligence, or at least alleged negligence. Now, imagine that you're a surgeon, right? 
and you're about to undertake a long operation, or maybe you've been operating for the whole day, and you're about to operate on another patient, and you think to yourself, I know that I'm going to feel tired. I won't be able to focus as well. And here's this medication that you could take, which would wake you up, make sure that you do the best job possible. It has no bad side effects. Why shouldn't you take it? What good reasons would you have not to take it if it had no bad side effects? Now, about five years ago, Queensland Health came out with a report which talked about how to deal with fatigue. And the report said, suggested, well, the way that people working in the medical profession should fight fatigue is by, A, taking naps, which, of course, not everybody can do, right? Or they should drink up to six cups of coffee. <laughs> Um, again, not many people can tolerate six cups of coffee. <laughs> not even me. Um, but it also suggested that perhaps in the future, modafinil might be a cost-effective solution. And this frightens me, the prospect that I might be required to take a medication just to do my job, right? In order to be the responsible surgeon. Here's another quick example. Three years ago, Jetstar cabin crew complained about the fact that they were being expected to work for 20-hour shifts. That's pretty horrible, right? To have to work for 20 hours. Now, the way that they presented their argument was that this was a very unsafe situation, because in the event of an emergency, they would not be able to respond. They would be drowsy. They would be able to think quickly and on their feet. Now, what worries me about this whole way of framing the situation is that what if their employer had come out and said, you're right, this is unsafe. From now on, we are going to make it a condition of your employment that you take these smart drugs that will wake you up, that will ensure that you do a good job. And don't worry, they won't do anything wrong to you. I would not want to live in a world where employers expect employees to take drugs in order to do their job. But even if you don't think that we're ever going to get to the situation where employers expect this of us, I suspect that we may even sometimes feel that we, have this that we place this expectation upon ourselves. So, suppose that you're going for a job interview and you want to be impressive, you want to make sure that you're sharp, that you present really well, and you know that other people might be popping cognitive enhancement medications. Mightn't you feel like, yeah, look, I'd like that edge too, you know, um, pop my little upper, make sure that I can do a, an excellent performance. Maybe you would like to do this in the course of your work all the time, in order that you become competitive. My worry is that once the problems associated with the current set of medications disappear, and they will disappear, right? Because that's what science and technology does. We develop better technologies. Once the problems disappear, once the legalities disappear, the legal problems disappear, cognitive enhancement will be poised to become the new normal. And once it becomes the new normal, like coffee, like painkillers, like your smartphones, you'll be expected to take them. It'll be the thing that is done, and you'll need reasons to not use cognitive enhancement medications. Now, I'll leave you with two more examples of why this is not something, some sort of futuristic scenario but why this is something that I think you should worry about. So, one example comes from a story written by Simon Tedeschi. So, Simon is a Sydney-based concert pianist, and he wrote a really clever article in which he talks about how concert musicians are taking, these days, are taking beta blockers to deliver beautiful performances. Now, when you stand in front of a crowd like this, <laughs> You get nervous. All you want to do is to run back out there through the door that I came from, right? It's really nerve-wracking. And the reason that this happens is that your body releases a couple of hormones, adrenaline and noradrenaline, and you get the fight-or-flight reflex. You start to jitter. You can feel your blood pressure. Um, you can't concentrate. But what beta blockers do is they prevent your body from responding in this way to these hormones. So you stay calm, collected. You keep your cool, and you, you know, deliver that fantastic performance. According to Simon, somewhere in the order of a quarter to a third of all musicians take beta blockers for their performances. 
and before they go to auditions. And they've been doing this since the 1970s, for the last 40 years. This is not new. The other example is me. You know, so to be here today, I had to come from America. That's a 24-hour set of flights. So I knew that if I didn't plan things properly, I would be jet-lagged, I wouldn't be able to perform, I wouldn't be able to say the things that I need to say. So, at a certain point during my flight, I popped a sleeping tablet and a melatonin. These helped me to sleep, and as the plane touched down here in Sydney, I woke up. I felt refreshed. And then I caffeinated throughout the day, made sure that I kept myself awake. And every night since then, since my arrival five days ago, I would take a prescription sleeping pill, which was prescribed to me, and a melatonin. And every morning, I would have my cup of coffee. Now, I am not the only academic who does this. <laughs> Seriously. And this is nothing, right? <laughs> this is just coffee and sleeping pills. And my worry is that my CV looks better as a consequence of the fact that I can fly around the world because I'm prepared to take sleeping pills <laughs> to deliver talks. And it's a kind of coercive situation. Okay, so what's the point? My point is that, unlike elite, elite sports, there are no anti-doping regulations for the rest of our lives. But without anti-doping regulations, as soon as the side effects disappear, as soon as the legalities get resolved, cognitive enhancement will be poised to become the new normal. And once cognitive enhancement becomes, becomes the new normal, we will lose our ability to choose whether to enhance. What I would like you to do, as a consequence of hearing this talk, is to reflect upon whether you think this is a problem, whether you think that we should allow people to take cognitive enhancement drugs, whether you think we should disallow people to take cognitive enhancement drugs. Because I would like you to participate in the discussion of regulation of these new medications in order that cognitive enhancement doesn't become the new normal. Thank you. <laughs>